Welcome to episode 28 of the Film Mentories podcast. This is Jamie Benning talking to you from my battle station here in South East London. It's late June 2021. Uh, I've been busy at work, hence the podcast being a little bit later than planned, so thanks for bearing with me. If you're a regular listener, thanks for joining me once again and for your continued support. If you're new, please do go back and check out some of the previous uh, episodes, including my interviews with the many and varied film technicians and artists I've managed to convince to come on the podcast. There's some pretty good ones in there. I hope you enjoyed episode 27 with John Lefkowitz, the director and editor of the documentary Sight and Sound, the cinema of Walter Murch. It was a fun one for me, just geeking out with John. And if you don't follow me on social media, Jamie SWB on Twitter and at Filmumentaries on Instagram, then you may not know the exciting news that I have Walter Murch himself coming on the podcast at the end of this month. I was able to meet him briefly on the 16th of June uh, before and after a lecture he was given in Primrose Hill. Um, it was the first time I'd been to a sort of proper event since uh, March 2020 and it was quite exciting to be able to travel up there and uh, meet the man in person. It really was a, a wonderful evening listening to this legend of filmmaking and I was also fortunate enough to have a short chat with Taggy Amirani, the director of Coup 53, the documentary about the British and US coup d'etat to depose the Iranian Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh. Um, Walter co-wrote and edited the documentary and I was fortunate to be able to buy a disc of the film uh, at the lecture there in London. But do visit coup53.com and take a look, as I'm sure you will expect, expertly told. Um, and hopefully Taggy Amirani, the director, will be a, a future guest as well. So look out for my episode with Walter in the coming weeks. For this episode, number 28, I spoke with Star Wars set decorator and alien art director Roger Christian about his beginnings in the industry as well as the fortuitous moments in his life when he was given the opportunity to work with some of the world's biggest filmmakers at the very birth of their careers. So here's my chat with Roger, recorded in early May 2021, and I'll be back at the end for a bit more jabbering on. So, Roger, when was the, the first moment that you realised that films were created by people? And was that when you knew you wanted to be involved? Actually, funnily enough, it was um, when I was a student. Um, to make money, I used to work for a company in Reading that put up marquees on exhibition grounds and huge. I mean, these were massive events. So, uh all of us as students got to work with them and we earned, we earned tons of money, seven days a week and it was early morning till late at night. One day we were putting up tents in Black Forest and I noticed this concentration camp that was built and there were people inside it and so at lunchtime, instead of sleeping, which is what we normally did, I um, I went across and I said, what are you doing? And they said, oh, we're building a camp. And I said, for what? And they said, for a movie. And I said, wow, it looks so real. And they said, yeah, it, well, it's so real. We have a tramp that comes by every day and gives us food because he thinks we're in here. They were painters. And I said, well, what's it for? And they said, oh, it's, it's for a film. It's Pinewood Studios. It's right next door. So the next lunchtime, my mate and I, went, of course, we couldn't get in. So we got under the fence, <laughs> went inside and they were making the first James Bond movie and the stage was open. And I remember the lights and the smell and all of this. And then I got in the prop room and I was picking, uh, picking up gold bars. There were piles of them from the Bond film and um, looking at things that weren't real and they looked real. And I said, wow, I got to do this. This is what I, I kind of hit my holy grail moment. And um, then right after that, the next year, I managed to get into art school in Reading and um, then I was in Maidenhead at the College of Art and my mate and I there, we went to London one day. He bought a Mark 7 Jag for £50 and we all went up to London with our girlfriends and I watched Dr. Trivago in um, the Odeon Leicester Square and I'd had an out-of-body experience when I was a child and, and the 
when that moment came when they were burying the father in the grave and this music was rising and leaves were blowing off i had an out-of-body experience and i said this is it this is the sign i have to get in this industry and that's how i did it yeah i knew nobody you know <laughs> my father had ordered me to be a priest a doctor or a or an architect and um I just wrote letters and letters and went to everybody. I, I, I tracked down the manager of The Who in London. I played him until he would talk to me because he was a first AD before he became their manager. Um, and I got all this, you know, everyone was saying, you just got to get in. And I, nobody was giving me how would I get in. And But one producer in Pinewood answered my letter, the only one out of hundreds of them. And he said, look, you've, you've been in the art department. You should go in that way. You'll have to do architecture. So I, I signed up to Oxford School of Architecture, got in for two years until the principal who become a friend of mine said, I think you should now go and do what you really want to do. And that's led to a job. Yeah, in reading, in reading your book, it's amazing how you know, throughout our lives, we have these sliding doors moments, all of us do. Some of us don't have the opportunity to have several moments like that and to have them all sliding in the right direction. But it seems you're very destined to do this job. Um, do you have a sense of that, that, that you feel that you, you made the best of the, the, the hand that fate dealt you? Yeah, I do. I, I, everyone asks me, well, now when the times get rough, you can do this or do that. And I said, I can't, I, I'm not qualified for anything else. But it, it went even further, <laughs> which is why I knew there was nothing I could do. I, I, I was so broke. I mean, my father just wouldn't speak to me. They wouldn't give me any money, nothing, because I said, I don't care. I'm quitting architecture school. And I sold a, a mini that I had, and I was thumbing a lift home from Maidenhead to um, Reading, and I got picked up by an architect who was talking to me and then he said oh he said you know when they did Cleopatra they were so big that they were hiring um, anyone from architecture to come and help in the art department and he said I think one of my guys who work in my practice has something to do with it he said call me back in three days and I called him back in three days and he said look they've, he's made an appointment for you to go up to Well Street can you do it and I said yeah of course so I went to LCD Studios, met this man, Charlie Bishop, who looked at all my work, and um, he was doing Department S. And he looked at my work and said, look, I'm just finishing this, the, the series. He said, I would take you on. There's no question about it. Um, and maybe in the future when I start another series, but I don't know when that'll be. But I've made you an appointment down at Shepparton. So I went to Shepparton the next day, and I met with John Box, and John Box kind of looked at all my work, and then he said, well, I'll take you on if you don't mind making the tea. And I, I said, I, whatever you want, John. And I realized then John designed Dr. Zhivago and Lawrence of Arabia. And John uttered the, the sentence which has carried me through really where he closed my folder and he said look i'll tell you what it's all about you're in the desert you've got a bottle of green ink in your pocket there's an airplane next to you there's a cloud of dust arrives the director and the producer and they look at it and say wow this is perfect uh can you have it read by tomorrow morning and he said you either do it or you talk your way out with an alternative on that spot that's the film industry and it served me ever and John mentored me and taught me because I came with hair down my shoulders Cuban boots and art department and watching independent movies every weekend I was watching every European master working and loving it I went into a world except for John Box of suits and ties and being told get your hair cut you've got to knuckle under stop watching all these stupid foreign films this is not what it's about you get at work on the drafting board, you work your way up. And I was having none of it. <laughs> and it, thank God John mentioned, mentored me and kept me from being fired, basically, and, uh, and taught me everything I've ever used, especially on Star Wars. I mean, all his aging techniques. It was Oliver, the musical we were doing, and just the sets were stunning. Just ancient London, beautifully done. 
So I learned on that. So yeah, it was a kind of, there's a serendipity here that really I've had no choice in my life. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? How some people may well have had those moments, but it's kind of acknowledging them and realizing them and making the most of them in some cases. Yeah, that's Luke Skywalker. That's what yeah. it's all about, Joseph Campbell, and that's what it's all about that George plugged into. And you, you, you've spoken in the book about how you um, got involved with Star Wars. If you could tell listeners, if they haven't already heard or, or read this, that you were on the set of Lucky Lady, weren't you? The, uh, the serendipitous moment of you know working for William Hayek and, and Gloria Katz, the writers, and uh, out there in Mexico, was it? Yes, we were in Guaymas in Mexico, and I was called out to help. It was a, a huge film, massive. Um, and there were only John Barry, Les Dilley, and Norman Reynolds handling this whole film. And it, it was getting out of control. And they had to split units to go. John had to go to Mexico City, and, and there were 52 boats fighting on the ocean. It was huge. And uh, so I, they called me out, and I joined in, and I was set decorating and um, I was doing a salt factory and I was actually digging the salt with my crew and um, a car arrived out gets young students they look like you know George and uh, Gary looked like me <laughs> really and he came over and asked what we were doing and had a look and was just very impressed because it was old Mexican buildings that John Barry was converting into sets that for the rum running period and they weren't like movie sets they had to look old and you know used and george described very roughly that he wanted to make a sci-fi movie and i i said you know I've, I've never really believed science fiction movies before i've never connected to them because they're all over designed and uh, i see it like an old car in a garage that's been repaired so many times and the, the owners kept it going and it's dripping oil but it keeps going and little did I know, of course, I was actually describing the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> and um, so George, in his usual way, he grabbed a shovel and started shoveling salt with me as we spoke. And then we had dinner that night. And yes, Gloria Willard had written the script. It's, it's one of the best scripts I've ever read. I just, it didn't work. Um, they had helped George. Well, they wrote American Graffiti and they they'd done some work on Star Wars. So when George was told that he would have enough, it, well, Fox said they would make the movie if he could make it for $4 million because they estimated the film would make $12 million. So they gave a third to the director. And then um, Peter Beale in England had told Fox in America that UK was half the cost of America. So the budget that they were coming up with was $8 million, which they said, OK, well, if you can go to UK and make it, then you can do it. And of course, they love John Barry. And he's, he was so brilliant, John, that they just said, George, you better go down and see this, this team doing um, Lucky Lady. That's how it came about. And we got hired in August and sent. we went back to London. And there was no money to make the film with George paid us from money he was owed from American Graffiti and we set up in Lee Studios in London where Ken Russell made all his films for four months just the five of us no one else and we had to work out how on earth we could make this film that was epic with such a tiny budget that's what we did during those four months. Was there was there a feeling that you were kind of this small band of students just quite trying to, you know, beg, borrow and steal everything you could to make these things. Because at that point you were, am I right in thinking you would have been making, you know, the early Land Speeder and the early, the wooden R2-D2 and things like that? Yeah, we, we well, John Barry correctly analysed that without the two robots, there wasn't a movie. They were the storytellers. And we knew we could make C-3PO because of Metropolis and Maria. Um R2-D2, there was no CGI in those days. The radio control was pretty primitive. So we knew we had to build one around a small person and we'd found Kenny Baker. So I hired the Monty Python carpenter who made all their sets and props because they really had no money. <laughs> and um, we set about making a, a wooden R2-D2 and to see if we could make it walk, which is what we had to do. 
and alongside that the land speeder was also critical um, and so we made mock-ups out of you know all this was done with wood from Bill's garage and wheels he had wheelbarrow wheels and things like that we had literally I bought a Jensen interceptor rear screen that exactly fitted the land speeder for 12 shillings we put that on you know and I, I, I found a lamp top for R2's head that that was 10 shillings um, we, we, we basically proved that we could make the things that couldn't be done at the time in a rough way and I also to establish a relationship with George and to see if I was right I'd, I'd always hated sci-fi weapons uh, they looked too light they were plasticky they beeped it was horrible and so I went to Baptist gun hire made out of a sterling submachine gun I adapted it with a few bits and pieces to make it look like the stormtroopers and I, and I chose Han's weapon because it was iconic I knew that he was always described as a western, western gambler and a gunslinger so I chose a Mauser and I made that into Hans gun and called George over I didn't tell them what I was doing and said you better have a look it was my test to see if we were on the right track and that was it George stayed with me and made we made Princess Leia's gun together and then I, I found I made prototypes during those four months for every single weapon using old and used weapons and adapting them during that time yeah, I've heard about George before creating that kind of environment where he kind of gets the right people in the right positions and then allows them sort of creative freedom, clearly with the pressures of, you know, money and time on you, but a freedom that allows you to kind of come up with these designs yourself and then, you know, present them to seek his approval. Uh, Nilo Rodis spoke about that kind of uh, environment that he, he fostered as well. And yeah, we, we've seen that with, you know, Ralph Macquarie obviously is a big, big part of this, this puzzle that you're talking about here. And, you know, we all know about his involvement with creating the, you know, translating visually George's vision. Um, but can you also define the influence of John Barry in, in realising it along with yourself? Yeah, uh, John was brilliant. I mean, I just, you know, an extraordinarily talented and intelligent um human being and wonderful with it and you know I don't know if, if you watch um, George Lucas he's having a chat with um, Christopher Nolan it's on YouTube they're talking about filmmaking it was quite recent on there and George finally came out with it publicly stated and there twice in it he said you know there were only five people stood by my side on Star Wars and that was the art department and that was true the rest of the crew thought this was a pile of you know I, you have to remember at the time the 70s american culture was really not regarded except for westerns in the uk and there was a definite whole attitude that shakespeare was god and what america was doing was not to be um, <laughs> revered in any sort of way so the climate was like that plus they, even les said it recently in an interview um, he said you know I didn't know what this was about this script I couldn't understand it I did because I got through childhood with myth and legend you know I was living in Excal Excalibur and uh, I watched all of the mythology everything so I knew immediately when I read it so I, I had that advantage I guess but um, John you know we it, all George could kind of describe were six paintings they were copies of paintings that Ralph Macquarie had done and in those paintings is Star Wars there's the whole vision of it and George didn't really say much we watched movies and for reference but nothing that was like what we were doing they were just ways to key in you know and I've always said this you you make a period film there's endless books and pictures and paintings and you know what to do and put in the rooms with science fiction there is nothing there's nothing to reference and especially at the time of Star Wars because nothing had worked before that so um, John designed the little prince for Stanley Donan um, that's how he came to be doing Lucky Lady um, he knew Tunisia 
and between Morocco and Tunisia at the time, Tunisia was safe, Morocco wasn't then, so he went down and he knew he could create everything George wanted in Tunisia without much cost. I had to go and dress everything and make it look kind of a little bit more and he just added a few domes and built the sand crawler and came up with an idea of how to do Luke's homestead, everything, you know, using two different locations. It was brilliant what he did. Um, and I think, and basically there are only two settings on Star Wars. George limited himself because of the budget. There's the Death Star and there's Tatooine, that's it. And so John and I adapted and used Ralph's influence um, to create the look. And, it, you know, George never really said much. That was not the way he works. And, I, you know, he did... His genius is to find people who have just enough experience to do it, but not masses of experience in the industry, because they're always the ones who are going, oh, no, we, that's not how... We, we did it like this. You know, it's always work. We have to do it like that. You can't do that with Star Wars. You know, I I thought of this idea of using scrapped airplanes to build into the sets, and uh, any other American director would have fired me if I'd suggested it. But John and George, when I suggested it to them and said I could buy a ton of stuff and make it look like an old submarine inside, they said, "Okay, let's do it." Um, that was because George was an independent filmmaker, and because he'd made THX, he knew what you had to do to get it on screen. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's amazing that it really pays off having those things, like you say, the, the airplane scrap and the real weapons and all of that stuff, because we don't necessarily fixate on those items, but subconsciously, I think we know they're from from reality in a way so it grounds us in what would otherwise be a fantastical film yes. i think you know so many i think of you know any other director would have made an absolutely different film to what george made of course and just by having those those items that exist in a real world that clearly have a function and they've been designed and the real talent i guess that you guys had was being able to turn those things and create kind of sense out of them I, I would imagine that you're thinking about how things would be you know creating patterns of things and also like i was looking at Star Wars this morning from a set decoration point of view and just looking in, in luke's garage there you know with the with the the the, the sky hopper behind him and, and the oil yes. bath just seeing like a, 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 um, a cable coming out of a wall and then feeding under the the doorway and outside you know all this kind of retrofitted stuff we just buy it without even looking at it. i mean i've seen that right. movie 200 times i probably have never noticed that cable there because it just makes sense and that's i think the real genius of what you guys achieved yeah yeah it was a matter of you know, i've just interviewed somebody in the one of the big directors in the um documentary i'm making now on what we did and uh he was saying when i looked at it i i, I was picking up some guns for his film and he picked up one and said see this isn't very star wars like and in fact they said well that's actually the gun that Han solo used and then he realized that all i'd ever done was gone and fix some gun sights that i found in a junk box in um, baptist the gun hire place and stuck them on and stuck a bit on the end and stuck a few what we call greeblies on it that was it and the thing could fire same with the stormtroopers. You know, I loved the Sterling submachine gun. I always thought, wow, this would be a sci-fi weapon. And all I had to do was stick T-strip on it and some gun sights on the top of that. And I had a weapon that could actually fire and blow, you know, a bit of smoke out of it. And um, it was heavy. The actors weren't pretending. They were having to pull these things around. And it, it kind of... Um, it worked because they. this led to the entire universe that we created. And I think, you know, when you think about it, it's the first science fiction film that connected to a global audience. And I think that they just accepted this was a world that was next door. Tatooine was next door. You could go to it and it was old and like places where they lived, you know. It's... Um, 
that was the mission that particularly I had because in those days the set decorator I had to do everything robots um, all the dressings of locations and in the studios I had to do the weapons I had to do um, vehicles I had to do the lot um, nowadays they split it up but I, I was like I had to create this universe. That that British crew with Gil Taylor, I've spoken to Madeline most recently. He was second camera assistant on the original Star Wars, and she was talking about just how difficult that relationship was between Gil and George. George being the, the young student-like American, you know, coming into this world that was already established. There was a way to do things. There was a way not to do things. Um, yeah. were, you, were you very aware of that relationship being very frosty at the time? Yeah, it was, I, it, when I arrived in, Fox finally greenlit the movie at the end of December, we were in EMI Studios on January the 6th, and we were shooting in March, just to tell you, end of March. I mean, to make a sci-fi movie, that's ridiculous, but that's what we had. So when I arrived, I'd got a prototype of every single weapon. And they had it laid out. They asked the first AD, the, the floor guy who did props, and all of these other people. They all came around a crowd and looked at it. And the first AD, they looked at my blaster for the stormtroopers. He picked it up, literally threw it at me and said, this is absolute crap. You know, we're doing a science fiction film for an American director. And they all left to get me fired. That's how I started, and it never changed since then. I just thought, well, I'm doing what George wants, and I'm doing what I want, and I don't care. And John was the same. For some reason, Gil Taylor would never, ever have a meeting with John Barry over how this... And this is absolutely how you establish filmmaking. The DP and the art director, or the designer, are there together. They're establishing how to do it. Gil would never meet with him. I don't know why, and, and he was... I, I think Gary Kurtz described him as very crotchety and that would be correct. There were so many confrontations, you know, and they weren't speaking. I mean, Gary Kurtz was the intermediary between the two of them. I felt very sorry for George, but George being George, he just, he never said anything. He just got his head down and carried on working and to get his film made the best he could do it under the circumstances. It was deeply exhausting for him, for me, for the John Barry. Yeah, I, I, I know somebody that went and interviewed Gil late in his life, and he did seem to have begun to regret the way he treated the American crew on that movie, or well, and yourselves as well as as, as Brits. Yeah, but I think it was very much a a kind of a boys' club, wasn't it? The film industry then, and um, having somebody come in and kind of change your, turn your world upside down must have been a big change. No reason to act like that, of course, but um, you can certainly see yeah. part of his perspective, I guess. Yeah. Uh, despite Star Wars being this kind of, you know, behemoth of a thing that it's become, I still regard those first two movies as, as kind of British movies, really. Yeah. And I think that's why I connected with them when I found out aged four or five when Empire came out that the movies were made. Hang on, what? People make movies? Yeah. Um, I then found out they were made, you know, just the other side of the river from where I was living and with a massively British crew. I, in some ways, I think maybe the Brits were more ready for a, a, a sci-fi film than maybe the Americans were because, you know, we'd had Thunderbirds and Doctor Who and UFO and Space 1999. Were there any members of the crew there that that understood that, do you think, other than yourselves? Um, not really. Um you know, John Morrow, bless him, would had come from being an assistant and he did do Gandhi. He was, and that's why George chose him because he wanted a kind of military look for the um, empire. And he knew we could get the kind of dusty Western like look because he showed the crew once upon a time in the West, Sergio Leone's great Western and uh, 2001 and said when you look it's a combination of those two he also showed satiricon which i understood why he showed it because it, it had huge sets and uh, the aging and the way it was done um completely confused the crew <laughs> <laughs> completely confused all of them and that, 
you know, when, when you're telling a British crew, no, we're making a spaghetti Western in space, they just didn't get it. Um, John did, John was in the office next to John Barry and he was always in my office plundering bits of my huge piles of scrap and interesting objects to put on costumes and he he joined kind of with us in, in um, how to do it really because he had no experience whatsoever apart from his massive war films. Um, and I think, I, I think, you know, the times were I, as I, I've said in the book, when, if I ever mentioned a dinner party, I was I was reading June or Arthur Miller. Oh, it's not Shakespeare, is it? That was the immediate put down to me. It was not. It was derogatory against me. So that was the attitude at the time. That the redeeming factor for George is that the British crews, whatever they think, they get on and work. They do the job. So it wasn't like the work wasn't getting done, it was getting done. But there were these camps that formed around Gill and even John Steers, the special effects guy, joined their camp. And so if you, if you have your DP and your special effects and everybody, and that's why George said we stood by his side. We, we never wavered, John and I and, and Norman and Les. We were with George and, and we'd become friends in those four months together um, as well. So. It wasn't easy, you know, but I was doing something I loved. I didn't care. I was going seven days a week. I'd have takeaway food driving home late at night because I had no time to cook anything. And that was seven days a week. Even the bank holidays, the huge ones we worked through, Saturdays, Sundays, it didn't matter. I was just doing something I loved. And so was John Barry. He, you know, he, he's, John was incredibly supportive to his directors. That's why Kubrick loved him. Yeah, there, there certainly seemed to be like a, a divide between the kind of work a day, this is just a job um, part of the crew and also, you know, your side of the crew, which were just doing what they loved and would do anything to help George reach his vision. I love this idea that you bought this all this scrap and that you took it to Tunisia as well. You know, I've seen those photos of the of the big trucks there and you can see some R2-D2 heads and some tubing and what I mean, how much did you have to pack as extra? Um, had you had you done a recce to Tunisia already, and how did you know what to take and what not to take? Yeah, I'd I'd gone um, with John Barry and Les. We went round every set and made notes on what we had to do. And John wasn't changing much, you know. We were he was adding domes, and we built the uh, sand crawler and I built that massive crash spaceship outside the cantina, all of those things. So I, you know, made prolific notes what I had to bring and there was no scrap there. There was nothing to build it out. Everything was used. You know, it's a very, very poor country at the time. And um, so they all thought I was nuts, but I was packing <laughs> junk airplane. You know, I bought these crash parts from aeroplanes, jet engines. I bought masses of stuff. The, the prop room was filled with it, which we broke down and put into components. But I had to take a mass down, you know, and then reuse. I mean, out, the cantina exterior was the last thing in the last days that we shot on Gerba. And I had everything brought up, all the animals I brought up. I brought up any speeder that we weren't using. I just got everything I could. The um, those water vaporators, they went in the desert, they went on the truck, they went up everywhere with us. They went to Gerba, we used them as background. We were reusing everything all the time. And um, again, you know, John, it's another part of his genius. He built everything that had to be built there into components and like the treads, say, for the sand crawler. He built those so that other pieces could be packed inside them because of the budget. We, they were limited to the number of trucks that could go down and everything had to go. So there was a, an entire huge stage full of stuff to go down, you know, and a lot of it was junk and pieces that the dinosaur skeleton on the dunes took up a massive amount of space. So I, we just packed it carefully. Frank Bruton, the prop, Property, big property master was a genius at it, just a genius. He, he, 
he made it possible and he made it possible for me to do what I, I had to do. Great. Yeah. You're probably good at, very good at Tetris. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, um, you would have been in charge of things like you, you just look at it from a props point of view in the, in those, and a set decoration point of view in those early scenes, there's just so much because those worlds are completely invented. And then you go into like the last kitchen with Baru there and she's, putting some food in a in what looks like a wishuma some sort of blender or steamer and you even went and chose foods that wouldn't necessarily be recognizable to a western audience yeah i did while well, she was cooking so I, I found chinese bok choy which now of course everybody knows no one knew in those days don't forget in london it was terrible i mean i i was an I was always in Indian and Chinese restaurants cuz it was it was cheap and it was not like British food that I've been brought up on and used to where all the nourishment was boiled out. I mean, you know, it was a different era. And after the two wars, it was pretty grim, all of that stuff. So, you know, you, you, if you got an orange, it was like a treat. So, um, I, yeah, I found bok choy and I found mostly Chinese stuff from a Chinese market that I found and bought odd things. And also I bought back stuff from Tunisia because they had really interesting shapes in their markets of foods and things like that. So, I, you know, that they were all organic. They were real. They weren't designed to be for a sci-fi movie, but they created a world that that's, you know, it's, it, all of those details, as you were saying, are what makes the world real. I I. I thought from you know doing the movies that I'd done and how my thinking went at the time. Yeah, yeah, and you, we we haven't mentioned it directly, but that you had another moment that's fantastic in the books when, book when you describe going to that for, you know old camera shop and going through boxes and finding what turned out to be one of the, if not the most iconic uh, movie prop of all time. Can you tell us about that? I, I had decided everything would come from found objects. And, and because of the lack of time, I also knew I could not design something, take it into the draftsman, have it drawn, built, made, polished, aged, and come out the other end. They were just overwhelmed with work trying to get through what we had to. So um, when I read the script that stood out for me i thought oh this is here it is excalibur for a sci-fi age and this is going to be the iconic kind of vision visual key to star wars this lightsaber it was a genius idea of george's and um i couldn't find anything i just searched and searched and i was getting hounded to get it because stuff was going to tunisia and um, that came about because of Luke's binoculars. I, I made those out of some old camera parts and things like that. And I thought, you know what, to help the audience know what Luke's doing, I'll put a couple of classic lenses on the front. Uh, I went to Brunnings to buy those. And I knew the hired guy, David French, and I said, I went to see him and I said, have you got anything I could look at? Like, a, I don't know, something for a, I've got to make a handle for a sword. and. He just said, go and look at those old boxes. I haven't looked at those, I don't know, in 10, 20 years. They're covered in dust. They were under a shelf of cameras and stuff. So first box I opened, there were the Graflex handles. And I looked at it and just went, oh, I just found the Holy Grail. <laughs> and um, I, I thought, I don't have to do anything. You know, it, it's, it's purposefully designed. And because of that, it looks so interesting and real. But I raced back to the studios and I had some tea strip from my um, blasters left over from the barrel and I stuck those around it. I did, did it all by hand and super glue. Everything was made like that in my office. And I'd broken down an old calculator and there were the bubble strip. So I stuck that in, that fitted, it just changed the clip enough and that was it. I called George over and said, I think I found Luke's lightsaber. And he walked in and just a big smile and held it, the weight, everything. And the smile is your ultimate approval. And um, so, you know, I just, I, I'd hired a friend of mine who made metal sculptors and uh, who I worked with doing animation. We were doing some in one of the periods during a break in filming. And um, I realized he had that talent. So 
I got them to create a new role in filmmaking in Britain, which was a special prop maker. And there was no budget again for him. They didn't give him any supplies. He had to bring everything from home. And so George wanted a ring on the end to hang it on Luke's belt. It wasn't going to operate in the desert. But um, so I took it down to Roger and said, can you put me a D ring on the end, which is what he did. And then I quickly made another one as a spare. And then I had to do a third one for John Steers for the special effects department to um, make. That was my idea, the wooden dowel, because I'd, I'd done art art installations and we used to paint front projection material and it would glow. We, we, we were doing stuff, a mate of mine and I, and um, so John Steers had one of my handles and adapted it, put a motor in it, and that was how the blades were done on Star Wars to start with. And George could rotoscope it afterwards, but it actually glowed on set. Yeah, it's a hell of a thing to have been there at that moment and, and having such a big part in creating something so so iconic. I have a uh, sitting next to me here. I actually forgot I had it until the other day. I've got one of the uh, 2004 master replicas um, of the lightsaber. Oh, and, yes. and, it, and it's just, it's quite a remarkable item. You, I said to my daughter, who's six, so what do you think this is? She said, I don't know. Um tell me and I told her and I said it's a lightsaber and she backed away from me right <laughs> right because you know she's seen a couple of the bits of the movies and it's because it looks it looks real it looks industrial yeah they're real you know and it's it's it carried through Star Wars it was an, an incredible invention that George came up with I thought that is it's iconic for sure it's made such a, a, a huge kind of change in science fiction having a weapon like that and it's perfect for the jedis yeah i was hoping that with the new sequels it was going to have a bit more of a a kind of through story you know it pointed to it in that first new sequel but then it kind of petered out with the second one and then by the third one we'd kind of forgotten about what we were you know why she why she was searching for Luke and, and why the lightsaber was so important. I was really hoping something interesting was going to happen there. Yeah, I know. We were all a bit disappointed in that. But there you go. I mean, you know, it carried through. And plus, what annoys me most is the set decker on, on Empire Strikes Back, who obviously got very lazy. He stuck rivets around my T-strip. And I, it's, it's human touch. It's not something that a mystical object like a lightsaber that Jedis create would ever have. And unfortunately, that's carried through to the end. It, it annoys me every time I see it because it's a human element in there. Rivets are, you know, the Jedi would not use rivets. <laughs> I use super glue and there was nothing wrong in that. It worked. So we've reached the halfway point of my chat with Roger Christian and we'll be back after these short messages. Here's what some people are saying about the Projection Booth podcast. This podcast takes no shortcut in producing outstanding content. How they haven't become more widely recognized is beyond me. I love this show. Smart commentary, in-depth interviews, and great production. It's obvious how serious these guys take their podcast and bring that next level of professionalism that anyone would be hard-pressed to match. There are few things better in life than listening to people who are both passionate and knowledgeable about their subject matter. The Projection Booth, with their wide and wild range of film discussions, is one of those things. Simple as that. The Projection Booth is the highest quality film podcast around. I love the focus on cult films, witty, informative banter, and amazing interviews. The Projection Booth is the best podcast out there, if you're a serious film lover. The Projection Booth Podcast, with new episodes available every week at projectionboothpodcast.com. Are you tired of pop culture podcasts where the hosts exist in a constant, blissful state of agreement? Well, fear not. Let me introduce you to the Chinstroker vs. Punter podcast. Mike is an ex-film student with a penchant for David Lynch, and Paul is your man on the street who likes what he knows and knows what he likes. Join us fortnightly as we discuss what we've been watching from our own very different perspectives. You can find us at csvsp.libson.com. Chinstroker vs. Punter is a proud member of the Pod Syndicate family of podcasts. If you want to get involved in the filmmaking industry but don't know where to start, check out raindance.org. Raindance is not only a film festival but also somewhere that you can sign up for training and courses in subjects like acting, directing, producing. 
There are short courses and full-time degrees. And if you quote Jamie 10, that's J-A-M-I-E 1 0, you can get 10% off. So check out raindance.org to see what catches your eye. And maybe you'll get that job you've always dreamed of. And then maybe you can come on the podcast. I was just going to ask you a question about, because I'm thinking about the time that Star Wars came out. And of course, timing was a very big part of its success, I'm sure. And you know, you've got the 60s there where religion and authority is being deconstructed. And as you say in the book, I think Lucas gave us something to believe in. And you've obviously got your experiences yes. in making the film. But do you did you take anything away from the film itself? Yeah, a huge amount. You know, he it, it, this is, you know, the, the mythology that was built in by Joseph Campbell mentoring George. There are keys underneath Star Wars and George made what is classical religions and mythologies and legends did where they tell a story on the surface and underneath it your subconscious is gathering information from these buried kind of messages to you that really help you growing up and if you look at the message of star wars it's exactly the message of jesus it's the message of buddha it's the message of muhammad it's the message of all of the great mythologies so George created a legend for the cinema age and it's no accident that it has connected to a modern world. You know, the world changed very after Star Wars, it's changed. And it was at that point that it was changing from a world which was dominated by two world wars. I mean, all of this stuff. And George was ahead of the pack there and realized and loved the power of cinema. So he put it into the, the philosophy of who we should be as human beings. He put it all into there. You know, it's the good versus the bad, light versus dark, and hope. He gave hope to everybody, and that's what the world needs more and more. Yeah. So, you know, that's why I've supported this this supported George and the sagas and why, you know, it's not out of ego. Look what I did. I'm very supportive of what children need to learn growing up and they don't get it so much nowadays that they, they were getting cartoons that, especially in America, that were pretty violent. Young kids were watching animation and stuff like that. In Britain, the, the more so there, people were still reading stories and I've got a seven-year-old now I'm reading every night I'm reading because I love it and I'm reading myths and legends he's absorbing stuff without me having to say this is how you have to be mm -hmm. you absorb it and I think that's George's gift to the planet definitely and George obviously gave a gift to the the filmmaking world and I think of, you know, Ridley Scott when he said that he saw Star Wars and just thought oh my goodness you know here I am making these period pieces and and this guy's making these films that are completely out of the world and you know he's in an entirely different universe and then of course you ended up working for Ridley as art director on Alien how did that come about well I knew Ridley um because I, I art directed commercials for him and his brother Tony I made Black Angel which was kind of um out and seen and when Star Wars had come out then Ridley got Alien and again the same parameters it was you know it was the first R-rated science fiction film so again Fox were very nervous about it so the budget was incredibly tight for a film like that I was actually on Life of Brian preparing I was designing it with Terry Gilliam and um, about to go down to Tunisia when Lord Delphont read the script and cancelled it on the spot and so I hadn't been hired on Alien, I couldn't, because I was working. <laughs> and in a way, it was luck for me, because I was in John Goldstone, the producer of um, Life of Brian, when he called me up there in London and said, look, I'm sorry, but uh, we, we've got cancelled, and we are going to make it. We want you to keep being involved and everything. And that afternoon, I got a call from Ridley himself saying, get your backside down to Shepard, and I need you. And uh, so I read the script and just thought, whoa. And then walking into Ridley's office and there was these 
five or six or seven original gigas around the walls. I thought, well, and I knew Ridley, you know, and I, you know, he was an inspiration. The duelist was an inspiration to me as well. Um, and I, I got to know him, designed these commercials for him. So we were kind of mates. And um, so he just said, look, I, I need you to create the Nostromo interior. And Michael Seymour, bless him, the designer, had, had never done anything like that in his life. And it's not something you just pick up. I, I, I'm, I'm going into a depth in the documentary I'm doing now on why I thought like I did from youth up. And um, the set decorator, Ian, who was a great friend of mine, we, we we designed um, Aiken Field together. We did Marla. We done, but Ian, Ian, he said it himself when I walked down the stage. He said, "Thank God you're here." He said, "I'm great at dipping curtains in tea and doing period films." You know, he he did all of the Merchant Ivory stuff, and he said, "I what do I do with all these bits of junk and stuff? I don't know." Thank God, can you, are you taking this over? <laughs> I said, "Yeah, don't worry, Ian. We'll we'll get through it." Um, and I think. So Ridley put me on actually there. They, he wanted to do a screen test for Sigourney Weaver. And uh, he didn't want to do a plant and a white wall, which is normally screen test. He wanted to build a bit of the corridor. So that was the beginnings of it all. I, I just got them to build the piece of the corridor and I dressed it. I, I began buying in all more uh, proper aeroplane scrap. They'd had a young kid doing it who didn't understand because he'd never done it before bought a ton more, brought it in and got it dressed. And that that first screen test is the really the, the foundation of making the Nostromo work. And then I, I was already wanting to leave art directing and designing and go and make movies myself. So because it was built, the Nostromo, as one continuous set, it was you went in it and you were in it and Ridley wanted that claustrophobia so he could do the opening shots and everything. Um, once I got all that done, I then volunteered to go stand by art director, which is where you stand by the director's side on the set the whole time. And most art departments hate it. They never want to do it because it's very pressured and, and they're not doing the way they want to do things. So I volunteered and so I went as standby art director. So I was by Ridley side the whole making of that movie and learning a lot. And another very difficult film to make. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine that, that, as you say, people were nervous about doing a, a standby art director job, but doing it for Ridley as well, who is so visual yeah. in in his you know imagination and yes. just the way he works he's a visual guy i mean fantastic illustrator himself he knows yeah. what he wants um yes so to try and meet his expectations at a moment's notice i bet that was a hell of a challenge yeah it was that that ship though the nostromo is a i mean you obviously took lessons that you learn on star wars and applied them there because you go through that ship at the start of the movie and we we have the environment revealed to us and we buy it um you know there are just those monitors blinking away there's the keypads i presume there were calculators or something um stuck on on there and then there's the seats that look used and there's that little breeze blowing presumably from some sort of air con or something like that we just buy it that was me yeah, yeah. that was <laughs> that <laughs> Ridley said, oh, I, we need, because it was the Mary Celeste shot going round at the beginning and um, mm. it had to be life. It wasn't dead, this ship. And he just came up with that idea when he was setting it up and said, how can we blow the, these papers? So I grabbed the hairdryer from the um, <laughs> hairdresser, got under the bench. It was really hard. I was cramped in there, but I was blowing it and said, tell me when it's right. And I was moving it around and he said, that's it. Yeah, shoot. <laughs> that's great. That was me under the bed. <laughs> with the that's how it was done. You know? that, that's like you know, it's the way I work. It's I don't work under unions and rules and all of this stuff. I just I too have a vision, and however you get to it, you do it. Yeah, it's problem solving, isn't it? When you boil it down to its sort of most fundamental. Yeah. 
um, elements, it's it, pro filmmaking is problem solving because there are going to be hundreds every day, and it's a matter of having the right people to know how to overcome them. Yeah, exactly. And you you were on you were on set for as you said by Ridley's side throughout, so you would have experienced the the chess uh, the chess burster scene, um, which everyone you know talks about yeah. in that movie being the key moment. I always say that I saw John Hurt on the tube once, and I, I recognised him. I looked at his face for about five seconds, and I spent the rest of the journey looking at his chest, you know, just thinking something terrible might happen. <laughs> um, I was only young, but um, what was that like? That moment on set for for you and the and the people behind the scenes. Quite interesting. I, I was the one who ordered the offal to go. Uh -huh. go I, I sent the prop boys with one of the specs guys down to the local abattoir. And they got a load of animal offal to build into the chest. And, and we had to build a table that split. And to be, I was on duty because I knew that once this thing came through, then we'd have to break and then reset it up again. So I had duplicate props. I had everything ready for that table. So I was on duty um, to, to as soon as he called cut, then we had to redo it again because there was, again, no time on that schedule. So, um, and Ridley kept it very quiet, as you know, from the actors. And, um, yeah, <laughs> he, he, he set the whole thing up, brought them in when we set it up. You know, John Hurt, bless him, they were just giving him, it was so uncomfortable for him. They just gave him more and more red wine and he was happy. <laughs> and they were, Roger Dickens was under the table, ready, everything was ready. And then that, he brought them down and the first, take it didn't break the um t-shirt so it came up and there was a, a stain of blood and it really shocked everybody and ridley sent them all away and then they restitched up and made it thinner where this would break through and then he just said to nick older you know put in more blood and um so the, the actors came back with already a kind of nervousness because they'd witnessed something and it looked pretty horrible but nothing happened well that next time they rammed it through and the blood went everywhere and i just you know those that's not acting <laughs> that's pure method <laughs> and uh yeah and again i you know you you had to realize it on the set this was a seminal moment in cinema and nothing like this had ever existed before and it and it bled into those deep subconscious fears that people have you know of, of growth growing inside them things like that yeah yeah it really does tap into something really primordial doesn't it and as you say those reactions are absolutely genuine aren't they, on the faces of the actors and Again, we we buy it. We buy the, oh, yeah. the the environment that they're in. We buy that moment, yeah. and it feels completely real. I I've got you know yes. three daughters, and they still haven't seen Alien because they're just terrified whenever I they hear me talking about it. Because it's just especially for young <laughs> yeah. girls as well. I think because the idea work. of the idea of pregnancy and childbirth yeah. kind of comes into play yeah. as well. And yeah, it's still today the same. You know, I they they actually had me review the first Blu-ray release of it. And they sent me a Blu-ray and I was kind of, I was so scared to put it in the Blu-ray player because I thought, oh my God, once you go digital, everything shows up. We made it out of junk and stuff. I thought it was might look terrible. And I was really surprised that it held up so well. Um, and I think, you know, it's a movie, you can come in on any frame and you start watching it and the music and the 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 tension and the claustrophobia today this film still stands out as a landmark it really does i was saying this when i went and interviewed ivor powell a couple of years ago my myself and my buddy who's a cameraman we shot an interview with him and we were sort of reviewing it in the coffee shop before before we were chatting to him and blade runner as well and we were just you know scrubbing through it on the ipad and no matter where we stopped it looks amazing <laughs> It just looks incredible, yeah, and you can see that that Ridley really does have that kind of painter's eye. That frame, you know, his framing is just outstanding, and his understanding yeah. of what needs to be in the frame to tell the story, yeah, really, really yeah. does hold up, and still terrifies me to this day. Even though I've you know watched yeah. it and I've deconstructed it, 
as soon as I hear that music and I'm thinking about it now yeah. and then the hairs are standing up on the back of my neck, you know. Yeah. I read this amazing, I, you know, I should, I would say 75, 80% of that movie was shot on Ridley's shoulder with a camera on his shoulder, mm. handheld. Hmm. Some of the best operating ever in any movie ever. Amazing. So you've been involved there with Star Wars and Alien, films that have, they've had a life beyond any what anybody would have assumed at that point. Um, and then you ended up working on The Phantom Menace as well in what would have been 97, 98. How was that? Um, how did you get back involved with Star Wars? And, and what was the atmosphere like on that movie? Well, the, the, what happened was, I was I, I, I'd made Black Angel, and then I made this short film, Dollar Bottom, which won an Academy Award as Best Dramatic Short. So it got me my first deal for a, a feature film, The Sender. And um, Fox cancelled that, and it was going over to Paramount. They bought it out to do it. Um, and I was waiting for the green light and George was directing second unit on Return of the Jedi. And he realized that he needed to be with Richard Marquand more just to keep Jedi on what he, because between Star Wars and Jedi, there was Empire Strikes Back, which was a much darker, even though they put humor into it, it was a much kind of darker vision. And George wanted to bring it back to his first Star Wars kind of um, way it was made. So he decided he wanted to spend more time on the first unit. So I was now regarded because I'd made, you know, he commissioned Black Angel and put it out with Empire Strikes Back. So I was now regarded as a director. And so they called me and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm at home. We're just waiting for the green light. So they said, can you come up now and take over the second unit, which is what happened. And I did about six weeks on Jedi. And then um, I was obviously making movies and I was in, um, I was up at the ranch because uh, there was, uh, there was some problem on a credit and they, they, Rick McCallum said, come on, I'd like to meet you because he'd taken over and um, George wants to see you. And so they said, come up. I was in San Francisco um, doing the post on a movie. So I, I went to the ranch and um, met them all, and they said, "You've got to come and visit us on the set." You know, that's, it was um, an invite back in England. And then, when I was back and I was talking, I've gone to visit. And I said, "Who's doing your second unit?" And, and Rick McCollum said, "Oh no, we've decided we don't need one. There's probably only a week, and Ben Burt's going to do that." And I, 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 I immediately thought, "You're." you're completely disillusioned <laughs> because George had only allowed 12 weeks to shoot this massive movie. So I said, Rick, I'll tell you what, because I love this world and, you know, and I'm such a supporter for George. I said, just put my name down. And he said, okay, I'll put your name down. You know, we, we just keep working. We don't really need a second unit. And I said, that's fine. Just put my name down. And uh, I was, I was actually... Um, I just finishing one part of the post in Vancouver and I'd gone back to London briefly and I got a message from Rick, what are you doing? And I said, I'm, I'm just waiting. I've got to go back to Vancouver to do a DVD um, release, do all of the color grading and stuff because the DP can't do it. And he said, can you come up to Leavesden now? Uh, would you be willing to take over second unit? So <laughs> I said, all right, let me make some calls. And I drove up there in the morning. This was still early morning when they called me. And um, I went in to see George and Rick. And they said, look, you know, we we, <laughs> we have a lot to do in our schedule. We, we need a the second unit will become first unit sometimes. You have to go in first. And they said, we've got great crews. They're the two crews from Indiana Jones, so they work together. Would you take it over and start? And I said, well, look, I, I could. Let, let, let me have a think about it. And, um, and Rick looked at me and said, no, we're leaving, George and I. I'll give you five minutes. You've got to say yes or no. <laughs> so we, they left, and I went, oh, God. 
And uh, so I said, OK, I'll, I'll work it out. And uh, Rick said, come with me. And next door, there was a secretary. There was my office set up, everything already. And I realized then that we went straight into a meeting and the big, um, the big arena where they all meet on those flying, um, it was that, it was the Senate. And we had to go in first on that, establish it, because uh, they couldn't do it. And then there was so much, so many different scenes that had to be kind of gone into like that. So, and then George said to me, and by the way, what are you, what are you doing in October? I mean, what? And I said, no, George, if I'm committed to this, I'm on. He said, oh, good, because I have to go back at the end of September and the end of shooting is in October. So you'll have to finish. That's how it happened. And um, so different, you know, George had got his respect as a filmmaker. The crews were, Rick had worked the crews on Young Indy and got rid of anything that didn't melge into a beautiful working crew on both, both two, because they leapfrogged episodes between the one crew and then the next crew. Um, and it was, yeah, it was, you know, it's, it's nothing like doing second unit. George even said one day up there to somebody else, he said, well, Roger directed half of the movie for me. I, it, there was such a load to do. And I was directing Leah and I was directing you and I doing fights with, I directed Natalie Portman at one point. It was not like a normal second unit. It was a full on experience and it was great. And it was still made with exactly the same attitude as the first one from George, but with a crew who were behind him. I remember Rick telling me he analysed that um, this $100 million budget, he had it sent out to Hollywood to get it budgeted in their classic studios, and it came out at $400 million. So it was done the same way as the first one, just a lot bigger, but now there wasn't... And, you know, there's no producers telling George what to do. Nobody's committees of studio execs telling him what to change. He just gets to make the movies he wants. And did you get the opportunity to um, to tour around the art department while you were there and kind of take in that, that uh, environment? Yeah, yeah, no, they were begging me. The, the designer said, please, can I, can I speak to you? And I, I went before shooting started. When I first went up there, I went to see him, Gavin. And he said, how do I deal with George? I mean, I don't know. He doesn't say anything. And I don't know. And I said, Gavin, there's a simple rule. You show George, if he smiles, you keep going. He'll tell you what's wrong if it's wrong. Otherwise, you're there to build his world, world for him without him telling you what to do. And then um, the set decorator did the same. He said, can I talk to you? He said, wow, how did you do? I he was doing the same kind of, I could see they were terrified. But I just said <laughs> to them, you just do what you do, you know, and you, 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 he'll always tell you, he's very involved in every single aspect of the movies. He'll tell you if it doesn't quite fit what he wants. But otherwise, just bring it, bring it to him. That's the way to do it. It's funny you say about the smile with George, because I briefly met George. I work on Formula One um, television production, so I was you know, traveling ah. the, the world for 20 years. And I saw George a few times uh, up and down the paddock, and I bumped into him at Silverstone. And when I told him about what an inspiration he was to me and I'd made my own behind the scenes documentaries about Star Wars, his face was fairly bland. You know, he'd heard this many, many times before and it wasn't until I started talking about the racing and who I worked for and what team he was there with. That's when his face lit oh, up you know, and I knew I was onto a good thing. Yeah. No, he loves Formula One. I do too, funny enough. I was just watching oh, yeah? the race yesterday. Yeah, well, that was. Yeah. I'm the. I'm. I'm one of the directors there, so I'm. I look after the kind of the the highlights and the replays and all of that stuff. So. Um, oh really? I've been doing that oh a long yeah, time. it's got so yeah. much. Um, nowadays, there's cameras everywhere, and you can see and look at stuff, and uh, yeah, and it's got more lively. My seven year old's watching with me now. <laughs> so oh, that's good to know. <laughs> Hamilton, really, Hamilton is. He's the best. And then he's, yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah, it's exciting stuff. Like it. George loves it. Yeah, I mean, you, you look back to some of his early stuff, you know, where he was shooting, yeah. I can't remember the name of that short film, where he's shooting that car going around that circuit somewhere in California. Kind yeah. of points already, doesn't it, at that point towards the land speeder and yeah. how he was sort of making the car look like it was hovering by just framing, 
it yeah. so it you couldn't see the wheels and things yeah yeah and it you know the um yeah the pod race in phantom minutes is a homage to well it's to ben Hur, but it's also to racing and the excitement mm. of it yeah you know, and the, the formula one has that it's the only sport i really watch yeah, I'm the same, really. I'm not a football person or rugby or anything like that. But I've all I kind of grew up with racing cars a little bit. You know, my dad had an interest in it, and I lived right near Brands Hatch, and oh, really? you know, I could open my front door and hear the start of the Grand Prix kind of thing. Yeah, um, no, I but, went in the uh, early days. I've still got a cover of Motorsport with I got a I got um, Dan Gurney's autograph, Jack Brabham's autograph, and um, I think uh, it's the one other one I got on there. Because you could go around the paddocks then, they were in the field. You just walked around, look at the cars and talk to the drivers. My son, my elder son, when he was, I don't know, I guess he was about 11 in Vancouver. I was making a movie and um, I took him to the um, Indy race. And uh, as we were walking into the track, the sound of these cars and the speed, you just don't get it. His hand took mine and gripped it really tightly. And... Um, yeah, he he was so impressed. And then I watched the the. I was also lucky enough to be directing in um, Montreal when that Grand Prix. So there we had an all access pass, and that was pretty exciting when Ferrari were doing well and Michael Schumacher. Yeah, yeah, I was there around that time as well. It's a great circuit. So I love Montreal. It's yeah, a great city. Great. So just to finish up, then I just want to not only mention your book to people to remind right. them about it but also talk a little about about the the documentary so obviously you got the book roger the um cinema alchemist which i recommend to to listeners even if you think you know everything about star wars and and roger's career after hearing this podcast let me tell you you really don't there's some great insights in there so that i've, I've got it in a ebook format but there is a, a physical version of it as well and then you're making this documentary roger so when when can we expect to see that? Have you got a slated release date or are you just working <laughs> on it until it's done? Well, because of COVID, they wanted it May the 4th. Um, but COVID has just thrown such a spanner in the works because I was going to go around and interview people and everything. It's called Galaxy Built on Hope, which is a play on because they the Star Wars Insider always called me Galaxy Maker and, you know, New Hope. We, I was doing it, crossing my fingers, hoping it would all work the way we were doing it. So I thought that that's an apt title. And it's... Um, I'm basically, you know, David West Reynolds, who was the one who almost forced me to write the book because it's a legacy for the Star Wars fans because they, you know, you can watch every single making of official documentary. There's not a mention of John Barry or myself in there ever. And um, this world we had to create was a part of Star Wars connecting to an audience and how we did it, you know, and of course, John Barry dying of meningitis early when he was working on Empire, there was no one to tell the stories except for me. As David West Reynolds kept saying, it's you know it's not out of ego. You you have to do it. No one else knows this stuff. And so um, he then got on to me <laughs> afterwards and said, you have to make a documentary on this. You've got because he watched me do podcasts and tell stories and lecturing. So he said, I'm sorry, you've just got to do it. You owe it to everybody, all the fans. So I got independent financing because obviously I couldn't go to Disney. They're, they're deeply committed now to making the new Star Wars. So they and they never owned the first Star Wars. They only obtained it because they bought Fox. Fox owned the first one. And so there's not much interest to them looking back. Um, and they're now having to reinvent the wheel. I understand it. They've got to make a whole new Star Wars that's nothing to do with the old, but give it the same kind of power for the universe. So they're committed onto that. Um, so I found I, I, there's a producer, Stephen Neer, who Wardour Studios in LA, he's got a boxing film that I'm working on that has a it's, it's a really interesting movie and he took me to China to the Shaolin Monastery because part of it is how the monks there um, help a boxer who's limited only because of the emotional stuff that's happened to him how they release it and gets him to achieve what he wanted to do it's, a, it's another classic hero's journey 
he then said, I, we've got to do this documentary, Roger. I'm a huge Star Wars fan. I, we've got to do it. So he partnered with, um, there's a producer here, Rita Sharda from Ideal Entertainment. They took it on. So we've made it same way, low budget. And, um, but I was on interviewing all these different people. Um, and Paul Bateman's in it because he supplies the Ralph Macquarie stories for me because, you know, he knew Ralph so well, starting with his website. He redid it for him and he built up. He now paints like Ralph. They became huge friends. And again, you know, you can go and Google Ralph Macquarie. There's, there's, I think there's one tiny piece of film on him. Nothing, nothing about this man. And if anybody influenced Star Wars, it's Ralph. He owes... I owed him his place, you know, and John Barry. There's nothing about John Barry anywhere, nothing. Those two, to me, were hugely responsible for um, committing George's ideas and vision to the screen and getting it done. And then, you know, I get this credit for creating the used universe because all of the stuff I had to add was the used and dented world. So I did right. I got to take some time off and do it, which is what. I'm in the final edit now I'm here in the cutting rooms and upstairs and then we'll I guess in about four weeks they were trying to do a press release um, on May the 4th just to say it's coming and we're going to be innovative I know it, it's my business model was only for Star Wars fans there's millions throughout the world and if we can Star Wars fans love Blu-rays. I don't know if you've seen, you know, the industry also said Blu-rays are finished, doesn't work anymore. But Star Wars fans, I mean, I think The Force Awakens sold $190 million worth of Blu-rays in America alone, let alone Britain, which is a huge. They want Blu-rays on their shelf. They don't want to download and in case, oh, maybe it'll go, maybe it'll disappear. Maybe Netflix will cancel it at one point and I won't be able to see it again on Disney Channel, whatever. So people kind of want to sign autograph one. So we're, our press will be towards getting to all the fans in the world to let them know this is coming. And that'll happen in a few weeks, literally now, to get it out. Um, and it's interesting, you know, I've got, you know, um, David Whiteley did such a great job with the Galaxy Britain built. And I helped David put that together, the um, location and shooting and I got Gary Kurtz in for him and stuff like that so he's with me in it he's doing Q&A's um, and I really go into the background I've got the man from Brunnings David French on screen saying what happened when I walked into his shop to find the Graflex these have never been foreseen and, and the carpenter Bill Harmon he lives here I've interviewed Bill and I've got him talking about how he made this wooden R2-D2 and instead of showing clips from the film because they don't mean anything when you're looking at it now and they're not isolated little clips don't resonate so I've got animation Stephen's got some animators and they're doing some animation sequences for me like when I read about the blasters it's we've animated my vision of it and we've animated the wooden R2-D2 who's never been seen by anyone He he's how we did it with Bill and you know I've got the I've got scenes from Forbidden Fortress to show where these two squabbling robots came from and how and how we did it and I've got animations like that to help visualize and then what Paul Bateman did was I'm stuck in Toronto but there's a um, there's a virtual studio here I found by chance so I may, instead of traveling, because I can't, because of COVID, I was able to, and then I thought of an idea, why don't I stand in the set? So Paul Bateman has painted sets for me, just like Ralph Macquarie painted them in his style. And I'm, so I'm standing in the desert with the Millennium Falcon and the bones in the desert, and I'm standing inside the Millennium Falcon uh, hold, which is really the influential set to me that went on to Alien and stuff. It's the one I think I got right, really right in it. And I interviewed John Lang, who um, his dad, Harry Lang, was on 2001, and he made the original cockpit of the Millennium Falcon for us. I've got 
a, a lot of Ben Burtt's telling me because I thought the sound should just be added a little piece. He's doing it. And then I've got directors like Guillermo del Toro talking with me about Star Wars and what happened. And I chose Gareth Edwards because Rogue One to me was really Star Wars movie. And Gareth has given me some big insights into stuff for him. Um, you know, and then, you know, I'm, I'm going into detail much more than I did in the book on, on stuff, just talking about it. So, you know, it's so long, we're trying to cut it down and put just the basic little pieces that we need. That's the hardest part. But as um, soon as we've locked this cut and I've got the last animations in, then I go into post and do it with some music and sound effects and stuff. And then that's ready to go out as Blu-rays. And I think what they're doing, because um, Stephen Nia at Wardour have, uh, he's for two years working with China on a blockchain for distribution. And um, so they're wanting to do it like an NFT, not, not the money side of it, but to do a kind of announcement on it, somehow tie it in so that everyone will be aware the Blu-rays are going to be sold and it'll be directly off the site and downloads. Nice. It's it's and then and then there'll be a demand now that people know there's footage you're cutting out. There will then be a demand for the director's cut. <laughs> well, there's yeah, we had four hours of material here. So I said yeah. that, and also the book. You know, there's a huge amount. I I wrote six hundred thirty pages, and John Rinsler, who's the head of literature at Lucasfilm, edited it down for me into a book, and then the publisher said. Forget all this other stuff. Start on Star Wars. Just Star Wars and Alien and uh, Black Angel. That's it. So there's a lot of stuff. You know, I grew up through an incredible time in Britain, the 60s, 70s, after the war. And, um, you know, I worked with Charlie Jenkins on uh, his sections of the Yellow Submarine movie. Um, and London was just incredible at that time. And, and, you know, the bands playing and who was out and music and everything. And that all influenced my, really, it influenced Star Wars. It influenced my, you know, how I could do things. Because in those days, anything was possible. You know, London working class people were becoming huge filmmakers and fashion photographers and writers. The world changed and, and it was those things that were happening so exciting that um, helped me kind of establish, you know, in a way who I am. And it, 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 it's continued to this day, despite the woes that the world has gone into and how things have changed and, you know, and studios took over and everything. But I've maintained my kind of independent spirit. That's great. That's, that's That sounds like a perfect ending. I think there. It does. Roger. Yeah. yeah, that's great. I really appreciate you giving your time today and um, sure. yeah, really enjoy the book. And I look uh, really look forward to the documentary. All right. All right. Thanks so much, Roger. All right. Bye. Nice to meet you. you. Take bye. care. Bye bye. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Roger Christian there. Thanks to Roger for giving his time and telling those engaging stories. Do keep a lookout for his book, The Cinema Alchemist, which is available in all bookshops now, and also for his forthcoming documentary, which should be out in, in the next few months, hopefully. For the coming months here on the Filmumentaries podcast, you can expect to hear from the mega-talented, multi-Oscar-winning sound designer Gary Rydstrom. We were able to reschedule uh, a date after he had to cancel at last minute on our previous scheduled date. We're recording that later this week, actually, so I'm deep in research. You'll also hear from director and writer John Patrick Shanley, which I recorded last week. And as I said at the start of the episode, a particular favourite of mine, Walter Murch, sound designer, director, editor, philosopher and author. He has a new book coming out soon. That should be an episode in July or August this year. I've realised that when we set the day, I had eight days to become an expert on Walter. Luckily, I've read his book in the blink of an eye several times. I've also been trawling the internet and uh, and, and reading as much as I can about him uh, in preparation for our interview uh, next Monday. 
Thanks as always to those who support the podcast via Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Jamie Benning. It really is helping me focus more time on this and to get guests of uh, an amazing calibre so far. So if you'd consider buying me a coffee or a beer if we've met, then please contemplate becoming part of the Film Rementories family as a patron. For as little as $12 per year, you could make a massive difference. Um, And also, this is part of my job now. I do take it seriously, and it does take a lot of work and research, as well as, you know, purchasing materials and hosting costs. So your contribution really does make a a, a big difference to me, and uh, I do appreciate it. The next episode will be my conversation with Dan Perry, Titles Designer. You can expect that early July 2021. Until then, take care, be good, as E.T. would say, and I hope you can join me again for the next episode of the Filmumentaries podcast. Mm-hmm.